Bon dia, buenos dias, good morning to everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the Convici to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, what I'm trying to show to you in this presentation is my last production and ideas about a conflation between my interest in the modes of inference and argumentation in uh, scientists and teachers and uh, some historical work, which is second-hand, of course. I'm not a historian of science. So I begin with a classical disclaimer. This is a presentation within the, fields of, within the field of didactics of science or science education. We had a lively discussion yesterday evening about the use of the word didactics, but I'm not going to uh, stop using that expression. Sorry for you. <laughs> Uh, which is mainly focused, this presentation is mainly focused in the philosophy of science, in the epistemology, in the ways of thinking and arguing, which is my point of interest in my research and innovation with science teachers, prospective and service science teachers, and o only collaterally goes into the history of science as the main source, as a discipline, I mean history of science in the second sense with capitalized H, as a source for materials for the construction of narratives that will be used in the, in the science classes of all educational levels from kindergarten to university. Okay. I borrow some words from Mercedes Izquierdo Emeric, a very well-known uh, didactician of science from Catalonia. She was my PhD supervisor. She says something like, when you go to science, go back to science, that science that you have already learned, with the aid of the classes provided by the history, philosophy, and didactics of science, uh, you get their hints, she uses the word pruebas, pistas in Spanish, hints to improve science teaching. This phrase is shared by many researchers in the field of science education, and it's quite dangerous because, as English people say, the devil is in the details, so you need an epistemological positioning when you say such a phrase. It could be taken by someone with a very scientific and traditional image of science, to uh, understand this phrase as the direct translation of the principles of the scientific method into the classroom, and I want to, to understand such phrase in a much more nuanced and sophisticated way, and I hope I can make my point during the presentation. Okay, the aims would be uh, understanding modes of inquiry, what I will call modes, modes of inquiry in science education. I focus first on the ways of thinking of real scientists, scientists in the no sphere, as Chevalier says, to get the hints there, to go back to the classroom, and especially to teacher education. These ways of thinking would be what is being done during the construction and justification of ideas, and during the translation into the classroom, I want to emphasize the educational value. So of the whole pool of things that you can discover in scientist science, you just take some of them and you rearrange them for the classroom because the main uh, value here is educational value, so not historiographical or philosophical value. And I will also explore a thesis by my supervisor, by Merce. Uh, she said that in science teaching in all educational levels, and especially in science textbooks, which is the, her object of attraction and of interest, you can recognize the two uh, main modes of rationality by Brunner, the logical and the narrative. And that can be said also of the science stories that we are uh, investigating in these ICSE conferences. I will introduce a modification of uh, Mercedes' uh, original framework with a third mode of rationality, which I call evidential. Okay, what would be a mode of inquiry in my presentation? Uh, just a working definition. I will define it as a, an array of scientific inferences and arguments, which is valid in a place at a time of history. So there are two big elements that I am in the conflation or the convergence between thinking and talking, the inferential processes and the argumentative processes, and this through the lens of the history and philosophy of science, located in a particular place and time in, the, in coordinates where these processes take a, a sense or a, have a meaning that is different along the history, the long history of science. So they are not uh, formalized and abstract and uh, general and, and transversal, but they are uh, sons and daughters of their epochal time, of their zeitgeist. Um, I, I, I like to identify this idea of modes of inquiry with this uh, construction by Ian Hacking that I like very much. He talks about ways of finding out. I, I like very much the verb finding out. We have a, an equivalent in Spanish which is even stronger than find out, which is averiguar. It doesn't exist in many 
Latin languages, and it's very strong. It's a w the way that you seek for something when you stick your nose when you're where you're not called for. Yes. So these uh, ways of finding out that hacking describes in his work, uh, paraphrasing Crombie, I think they're very valuable, and this is the object of my uh, idea or framework of model of inquiry. So the motivation would be this. Uh, historical epistemology or epistemological history of science or philosophical history of science, this interface, this rich interface in the last 25, 30 years between philosophy and history of science, where some researchers have aimed at uh, investigating into the analytical categories of scientific cultures. This is Winter's phrasing of the idea. Uh, these big uh, categories uh, to capture this modes of working and producing ideas along the history of science. Uh, with a philosophical perspective. And uh, following Winter and other authors, I would say that the paradigms, the styles of scientific thinkers, thinking, then Stille, etc., etc., are all uh, good examples of such a category of uh, analytical categories of scientific cultures. So I will take one of the many versions by Ian Hacking of. Uh, the styles of scientific reasoning. This is, of course, an adaptation of Crombie's original ideas. And one of the most uh, diffused and stable versions of such construct is this one, uh, comprising seven styles of scientific reasoning. Uh, I, I have sort of corrected the names. They're not the real, the original names by hacking. They have been corrected through a long process of uh, transformation to educational ideas. So this is the, the phrasing that I use with science teachers. And you have the axiomatic, experimental, analogical, taxonomic, probabilistic, genealogical, and laboratory. If you remember, if you have read, if you have well read your Crombie and then hacking, you will remember probably that uh, there is a hint that these modes of thinking or styles of reasoning are sequential in the history of science. Departing from the ancient Greece until the uh, second half of 20th century in this uh, uh, techno science. But then both of them say that even if they're, they're sequential, they are overlapped. There are styles that remain and, and uh, coexist today. That they were just emphasis of foci during the history of science, or there were productions uh, that were included in the history of science uh, through the culture of, of each uh, moment and, and era. I am now emphasizing the ones that I would like to focus in on uh, in my construction of uh, this idea of mode of inquiry. I, they are precisely the ones that are not very conspicuous and very visible in the classroom. I have just eliminated the experimental, the probabilistic, and the laboratorial, which are uh, um, the ones that are uh, at the forefront of uh, traditional science teaching. So I would take the other four, which I find much more interesting. And I think uh, Peter's presentation of uh, new experimentalism and, and recent ideas in the philosophy of science is, uh, gives quite a support for this uh, claim of mine here, that uh, the, the three modes that I have uh, excluded are uh, connected to this um, uh, excessive focus on the experiment and the obscuring of the rest of the process of thinking that uh, Peter showed in his quotations of great philosophers of science. So, some features of my idea of mode of inquiry. Modes of inquiry can be seen as styles of thinking, ways of reasoning, and methods of argument. Methods of argument is a phrase by, by Hacking, which I take and steal from him, and I like it that very much. They are rather independent of their own history, so if, uh, even if they, are ca they can be characterized historically and they can be traced back to the history of science, they become independent of, their own, of the history of science and of their own history, of constructive history, the development of scientific ideas, to become uh, canons of objectivity of standards what of, of what is reasonable, and these two phrases are also from Hacking. So when, you moved, when we move to science stories, to the narratives that we use in science teaching at all educational levels, the, the modes, the main modes, appear either separated or confronted or reconciled according to the historiographic tradition and the, w and the way you construct the narratives. And this is interesting because we could uh, sort of examine what is, has been presented during the conference, the three days of the conference, in terms of narratives and uh, science stories to see with where the decisions made by the authors in the construction of narratives in terms of reconciling or separating 
or converging uh, the styles of thinking. Okay, how do I approach the issue of modes of inquiry in science education? I take um, the orthodox approach to uh, rationalities, uh, initiated by Jerome Brunner and continued by many other people. As you notice here in this slide, as opposed to other previous slides, there are no philosophers of science or no historians of science. I'm just now taking uh, the stance of uh, education and cognitive science and narrative and linguistics in this field. You recognize that they are Walter Fisher and Anton Lawson. Okay. Um, in the um, standard approach to modes of rationality or, or uh, ways of thinking, there is a uh, sharp distinction between the two extreme modes, which correspond to Brunner's paradigmatic and syntagmatic, and it, they're usually called in the realm of science education and uh, by these authors the logical or logical linguistic mode and the narrative mode. Okay. If we go back to the Crombie hacking apparatus, perhaps we could say, and this is forced, but it serves the purpose of my presentation, that the logical uh, mode of rationality in Brunner would be more or less the axiomatic way of thinking in Crombie hacking, and the narrative would be the genealogical, more or less. It's an approximation, we can discuss it later. Okay, if we take this uh, standardized view, with, which is very raw and very first order, we could say that the logical mode is associated to the context of justification of ideas in, in the classical sense of context by Reichenbach and their successive modifications during the 20th century. It is more or less uh, associated with deductive reasoning, probative reasoning. Uh, it has to do with the stabilization of the static structure of the scientific disciplines. And this also marries very nicely with Peter's presentation because you could say that this a posteriori reconstruction of the experiments and experimental settings uh, is parallel and accompanying the same process of stabilization of the synthetic, synthetic structure where the new experiments are just confirmations of laws that we know instead of constructions of laws that we don't know yet. Okay. And of course it, this mode will be associated with concatenation of knowledge in the uh, end form of nomothetic, axiomatic, demonstrative propositions as opposed to the narrative mode, uh, reconstructing, heavily reconstructing Brunner's ideas. These are part my ideas, part Merce, part Anton Lawson, and so on. The narrative mode will be associated to the classical discovery context by Reichenbach, uh, would uh, resort to ampliative uh, reasoning and inference, non-demonstrative inference, so moving from the orthodox uh, logics by Aristotle to uh, openings in the same Aristotle that gave birth to non-demonstrative uh, logics. Uh, it's associated to constructive, to long and very uh, laborious constructive processes of ideas, to the historical development of scientific disciplines, perhaps to inductive process in the 19th century, and this led to the discussion with Maria Lise about the nature of biology and physics as opposed to one another, and the argumentative aspects of science that are some of those mentioned by Peter that are obscured when you put the focus only on the experimentation and the hands-on part of science. Okay. Merce has proposed that these two dichotomic uh, styles of thinking can be more or less linked to detective novels. Uh, she's a fan of detective novels and so am I, so I love this idea. And she identifies the logical mode with uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and the narrative mode, mode to the new uh, 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 detective uh, literature, especially the post-black uh, detective literature like uh, Mankell and Camilleri. The one nice thing is that we have uh, lots of uh, 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 film-based reconstructions of these also, both of the classical Conan Doyle and of new detective novels. So this is a good entry point for students and teachers where we are sure that they are not going to read a whole novel. And they can uh, nevertheless get access to these sophisticated thinking processes through uh, material that is multimodal and much more attractive to them. Um, I must say very briefly that uh, there is a lot of literature saying that the modes of inference uh, portrayed in Conan Doyle's novels are abductive to which I agree. Uh, 
but the presentation a posteriori in the in the last part of the uh, uh, the, or the short stories and novels is uh, the classical who done it the butler did it which is deductive and uh, probative see okay i will go on taking something that Brunner has said it's not my invention that the, this dichotomic way of seeing the two ways of thinking is uh, exaggerated and there are some nuances and grace in between so I will try to um, modify Mercedes canonical version with a third mode of rationality a third of mode of inquiry uh, that draws from a rationality inquiry based rationality evidence based rationality such a such a third mode of hybrid mode of rationality uh, is based on the Latin idea of vestigia, yes? Uh, traces, clues, evidences, tracks, and prints. And this metaphorical idea is very useful in, in the classroom. It, I'm not, I haven't invented it, it's very well known. Most teachers use it. Uh, the idea that uh, scientists can be seen as detectives or people following traces and, and uh, footsteps and things like that. And from this uh, vestigia, they reconstruct the ideas in a Persian mode of linking uh, facts and uh, and inferences okay as I see it this third hybrid mode which is much more f uh, fluid and interesting and powerful in terms of uh, its capacity to produce new ideas that uh, that pull the field forward is shared by many uh, human activities like detectives policemen police people uh, medical reasoning, forensic reasoning, archaeological reasoning, and so on and so forth. Uh, one example that I use in my classrooms is uh, that of, um, I don't know the name in English, but maybe uh, uh, science illustrators, the guys that do the reconstruction of dinosaurs and things like that. This reconstruction from bones that are very fragmented and very incomplete to whole uh, beaches, whole monsters that are animatronics in, in parks, is uh, done through abductive processes that are very sophisticated and they have ar an artistic component and also very uh, well-founded scientific components. And as uh, Maria Lisi and other people from the field of biology know, uh, once you get to this monster, you, can, you are prepared to reconstruct it very quickly when new evidence arises. So this is a, 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 an, a, um, an example that I use very much in my classrooms of this kind of relationship between facts and inferences that is typical of the evidential uh, mode of inquiry. Okay, if I say this is a hybrid, a third hybrid mode, then it should uh, be the case that there are the two main characteristics of the two opposite dichotomic modes of Brunner should be somewhat uh, playing a role here, having something to say. The two dichotomic characteristics that Brunner uh, um, attributed to the two modes are very similitude and veracity. Veracity for the logical and very similitude for the, for the uh, narrative. And I think then the hybrid uh, rationality, which is evidence-based, should aim or is, is aiming at uh, a balance and nuanced combination between veracity and very similitude. I will show you an example now. And then if I will go back to the Crombie hacking uh, framework, I would say that more or less it will be the analogical uh, mode of inquiry or style of thinking, which is supposed to be the one started up by Newton and colleagues, okay, in the, in the vertex or the apex of human thinking. <laughs> the construction of the cathedral, absolutely. I, I, I knew it, you would like that very much. <laughs> it was dedicated to you. Uh, so I would say that this third mode of rationality is uh, defined by its goal towards inference to the best explanation. I'm distinguishing between inference to the best explanation and abduction, even though in English the distinction is not that uh, strict. Uh, for me, inference to the best explanation is just the aim and is very general and comprises several different modes of reasoning. One of those would be abduction in different uh, meanings and senses. Okay, so now focusing in evidence-based inquiry, uh, I understand inference to best explanation uh, as a pragmatic uh, concept where best is best for a given state of affairs that is problematic and from a certain point uh, 
point of knowledge or knowledge base that is accepted at some time or and at some place. Thus, it is a pragmatic uh, notion that is open to revision when these two things change. And it, this uh, uh, going to uh, inference to best explanation is, in my opinion, uh, very much uh, founded on abductive reasoning in its many senses, which are akin to Peirce's reconstructions, the hypothesis, presumption, resolution, reverse deduction. Peirce has one bad point that is was very prolific and has written like 300 patients only on abduction in during 30 years, so it's very difficult to know what he meant by abduction and to grasp his very sophisticated ideas. Okay, then I move to how I work with the narratives and uh, student teachers and teachers, uh, in-service teachers. Um, I resort to non-philosophical, non-historical materials. I go to the series ALF of the little mischievous alien stuck in a middle-class home in the United, somewhere in the United States of America. There is a very delicious chapter in the series, uh, which is called Can I Get a Witness, in which ALF is accused of a crime that he did not commit, namely the breaking down of a big window at the Ogmonix house. The Ogmonix, you remember, they were the, the neighbors of, of Alf's family. So uh, everyone accuses Alf, who deserves a fair trial, and there's a farce or a, par a, par a parody of such a trial uh, in the house, in the household, where Alf is the lawyer defending himself. Okay, and I use this because it's a rather beautiful episode in which the mechanics of inference to best explanation, the, mu the use of the hybrid uh, rationality is totally complied with, but there is a preposterous non-compliance of the conditions, the pragmatic conditions of such uh, inference. So I use this as a reduction to absurd, as a way to, to, sh to show that there's no way of formalizing these inferences, that they are heavily contextual and heavily pragmatic, that you know uh, you have to know the the, um, the mechanics, the the, the, the logic part, the logical part, but you have to know also the nuances and the sophistication of its use in in contexts. Co okay, this is um, uh, a quotation from the from the series. This is Alf's uh, word, exact words. When he's trying to defend himself, he says, "Okay, the Ogmonics have invited Ella Fitzgerald over for tea. She hits a high C, singing something blues or jazz." And whammo, there goes the window. So it's a, an explanation resorting on the physics or acoustics of uh, opera singers. As opposed to the other two uh, models of resolution of the conflict that are discussed during the episode, which are, the first one is that Alf is the culprit. He has done many mischievous things in the past, so it is an, an, uh, just plain induction, a pattern. Alf has torn down, has broken this, and, and has missed mess with that, and so he's the, the culprit. And then the last uh, answer at the very end of the chapter where Mr. Ogmonic presents himself as the culprit as the uh, doer of the, of the breaking down of the window because he's anthroposic and he w needs to feel the adrenaline of being 20 years old again and he wants to play uh, as a quarterback in American football and he has uh, kicked the ball and, and breaking down the, the window. Okay, with this, uh, just uh, an interpolate of the classical presentation by Marseille, I will put here the third uh, mode, the paralogical mode, the evidential mode. I attempted at uh, uh, showing with my topology that it's, I think it's closer to the logical mode than to the narrative mode. It takes the big... Um, the structural components of the narrative mode, but infusing them into something that is mainly logical in its structure, lo logical linguistic. And of course, the queen of detective novels, my hero, absolute hero, Agatha Christie, will be the representative of such a mode of inquiry. Okay. So what, what about science stories? Merce, uh, as I told you, uh, tries to identify these Brunerian ideas in textbooks primary and secondary textbooks, and also university textbooks, and also historical textbooks from the history of chemistry, uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. She's an expert in the history of chemistry. So she finds out that the typical, the practically the most uh, diffused 
logical rationality text is the explanation of the rainbow, which it features in every single text of physics, introductory physics, for primary, secondary, and uh, superior upper education. The typical uh, epitomic, uh, paradigmatic text of the narrative rationality will be Becquerel's fortunate mistake or blunder during that uh, day in Paris where the sun didn't come out, uh, as it does. It happens like 270 days a year in Paris, so no, no, no news. And that leads to the reconceptualization of uh, uranium's uh, hyperphosphorescence or fluorescence into the presence of uh, Becquerel's. And if we, if we um, extrapolate Merced's ideas and try to find out an evidential rationality text, there will be the crossing a river problem. As Peter said, for those of you who are not familiar with physics textbooks, uh, it's a typical problem of uh, relativity of movement and comp composition of movement, where there's someone who wants to cross a river swimming, but the river moves, and you have the composition of the swimming and the, uh, the movement of the river. Okay, this is usually uh, portrayed in the textbooks as, an, as a hybrid text where there's the logical part uh, with the laws and Galilean composition, but there's also a character trying to do something and finding obstacles to do so. So what place can be given to evidential rationality in the production of science stories? This is the last part of my talk. And I must say here that I haven't talked to Peter before my lecture or his lecture, but we have done a thing that is more or less similar. I was astonished that he uh, stole everything that I was going to present and presented it first. Okay. Just uh, uh, even the aesthetics are very similar. The white letters and the little figures of experimental devices. So I will take um, Rutherford's construction of the planetary model for the atom as a case. It is very, has been uh, visited uh, extensively, so I don't pretend to be original. I'm just resorting to second sources in the history of science and in the, in the interface of the history of science and the didactics of science, such as Mansur Nias and many people here in Brazil who have uh, uh, gone into the, into the case and have uh, produced uh, insightful and powerful materials for, for teaching. Okay. We have now a stylized, I have here a stylized version of the device. This is a Tupperware model where the whole thing was put into a Tupperware, something similar in back there in the early 20th century to get sure that there was a relative vacuum in the apparatus and the rays from polonium were not uh, detained by air. Okay. For us uh, who are trained in physics, this is quite transparent. We can read this and identify as Rutherford's experiment, okay? The wrongly called Rutherford's experiment. For the rest of people, for lay people, it's quite difficult to read this. This is a transversal section of an apparatus that was quite big. I didn't put the magical hands that Peter had in his own presentation to show the scale. Okay, what I did here is what we are not supposed to do, this uh, Stroman approach. Uh, I took a canonical textbook, which is not really a text, it's a web page, very well known and very, well, very much used in physics education, upper secondary school and university, Cambridge Physics, and I just spotted for the the right episode, which is called The Nucleus, Rutherford 1911. You just browse the web and there are some different windows and you click on the right window and you get this. This is a monstrous abortion, historically, philosophically, and didactically, didactically speaking, but it's not as bad, as grotesque, as the things you might find in textbooks. So this is much better than what you, what you find in secondary and university textbooks worldwide, mainly in the United States, where most textbooks are produced and then translated into Spanish or Latin America, and also in uh, original Latin American books of main publishing companies. So if you go through the text, and I won't do that, uh, it's very boring and very long. The typical verbs indicating a scientific approach and um, uh, scientific method-based approach feature, like discovering, detecting, announcing, etc., etc. But there are some refreshing points. Uh, there is uh, uh, an interpolate at the beginning uh, about the, the, the effect of the mica uh, plate in the deflection of, of uh, uranic rays or Curie rays. So it's much better than it in the textbooks. Uh, so there is a genuine problem at the beginning. They 
to tell the students, okay, there was something mysterious about the the, um, the behavior of uh, a uranium rays. Then it moves to the Geiger and Mazen affair. There is no confusion here. There are three different people, and the hierarchic relationships are much better described than in usually that they usually are in the textbooks. They say that they hire Geiger, uh, Geiger and Rutherford hire Marsden to do the experiments, etc., etc. So there are uh, uh, more than one experiment. They are not attributed to Rutherford, and there is the distinct participation of three different physicists in such experiments. Okay. Uh, then there's a, a quota, a little bit of surprise and aha moment. Geiger came back very excited, saying something to Rutherford. Okay, and then this is the weakest part of the text. It goes back or falls back to the traditional uh, narrative where the deflections could not be explained with the uh, uh, state of affairs or state of the art uh, domaining the place and the, and the time. Okay, so. The, the, from this part on, it goes on. It, it, it transform, the text transforms itself into the uh, never-ending quest by Lord Rutherford in order to find uh, the cause of such uh, unexplainable effect. Okay. So at the end, there's a big proposal: proposal the atom contain a massive nucleus containing a positive charge. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, one good thing about the text is that it does not say that this happens exactly in 1911 and exactly in that paper. There's some. Mm gray in it, but uh, what it says in the end is that he proposed the existence of a nucleus and that explains completely the uh, mysterious behavior of organic rays. Okay. And there, then there are inter there's an interpolation of uh, more logical linguistic uh, elements. There is an explanation provided by Cambridge reconstructing uh, the canonical explanation by by Rutherford, and saying that such an explanation is a revision of uh, Thompson's plan pudding, uh, where the second model, or the, f the first one historically, is abandoned, and the new one by Rutherford is the one that is going to be accepted by the community. So if we take the whole thing, and I'm being quite quick here, there are four tenets, epistemological, historical, and didactical tenets, that I want to revise in the case. The atomic nucleus is discovered by Rutherford. The experiments provide a basis for the discovery. The results of the experiments are unexpected and contradict Thomson's classical model of plum pudding. And large angular scattering proves the existence of a small positively charged nucleus in the center of the atom. Well, all of this is a lie, as you know now, being uh, fans of the history of science. So, Dismissing the certainties for science education, especially for science teacher education, which is my focus here, uh, require examining Rutherford's modes of inquiry or mode, abductive mode of inquiry with primary and secondary good quality historical sources, my framework on evidential rationality, and previous results from the line of research in didactics called the nature of science. So this is what I did, and here are the results. The results of the experiment uh, are not fully unexpected and contradictory. Quite on the contrary, there were some experiments from the Thompson part by James Crowder and other colleagues, and these were satisfactorily explained with the plum, plum pudding uh, model. And this is known to Rutherford, who begins the paper, his own paper, with saying such a thing. So there's no surprise, no horror, no tremors, no nothing. It says there is a long line of doing scattering of particles uh, with materials, different materials, and this is well known, and it has been explained satisfactorily with uh, Thompson's pudding so far. Okay. This is more or less what uh, Peter said in his own case studies. Then Rutherford does not discover the nucleus. He, it is possible or plausible to assume that he proposed the idea in an adaptive inquiry mode in an attempt to question the knowledge basis with politics uh, within uh, to confront Thompson's uh, school of thinking and, and uh, paradigm or program and at the same time better adjust mathematically and topologically and uh, physically and with hypothesis the results uh, obtained in a series of progressively more refined experiments or, uh, searching for the profiles of scattering probabilities for different angles and different uh, 
uh, plates of different substances and different rays and different energies and different settings and so on and so forth. Okay. So. Additionally, experiments do not far from settle the matter. Uh, in a letter to Bragg, Rutherford accuses Crowder of using too much imagination uh, in his reconstruction of the results through uh, the pudding and also of being unable to realize the limits of application of standard theory and so he's paving the way to present his bold proposal of a planetary model as the best explanation for the results. Uh, also Geiger's recall of his work with uh, Rutherford in 1910 and 11, this would correspond to Cambridge is, uh, he came very excited. Yeah? Uh, in the winter 1910 to 11, uh, allows us to see how the model reverts onto experiments. It's a cyclic and sophisticated iterative uh, way. Uh, require refining the experiments in the light of the new ideas. So as Peter presented in his presentation, this is a much more complex uh, relationship between experiment and, and theoretical ideas that revolves through the years and takes a spans over a period of six or seven years of debate and controversy and refinement of experiments and proposal of new ideas. Uh, of course, there are more uh, experiments after the initial and seminal one. In fact, this was taken not from the original by Rutherford, but from a 1913 paper on the 1912 and 13 experiments by Geiger and Marsden. And in the end, or oh, 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 just last but not least, the nucleus is not proved. Quiet, on the contrary, if you read the paper, that which is now available for everyone because it's on the web. Uh, some 20 years ago, it was difficult for teachers to, ac to get access to the paper. Only initiates and Illuminati had the paper. Now it's fully available, and they can read it, as Breno said in his own presentation. And uh, one great challenge for them is to find where the word nucleus is. There's no nucleus in this paper. In fact, in the last sections of the paper, Rutherford says we don't know whether the nucleus, which is part of the divergence of charge, is either negative or positive. We are not sure because both negative and positive charges in a divergence of charge behave exactly the same as far as uh, uranium ray rays are uh, implied. So a, reading, a new reading of the case with more educational value has these virtues. As you can see by now that I'm going to end my presentation, there's nothing new from the historical point of view. For historians of science, it's a plain presentation with no news, just a re recollection of the best second sources, uh, standard second sources that are now available in, in the literature. The big jump here, or uh, jump forward, is that science education has not seen and taken into account that this is standard history of science and philosophy of science, that we are zillions of years, light years, uh, far from such a presentation in uh, school science and university science. So my, my desiderata, as Peter said, would be that, uh, trying to infuse these ideas or discuss these ideas with uh, in-service and pre-service science teachers. That the atomic nucleus is invented as uh, Ella Fitzgerald's participation in the breakage of the window as an attempt to provide a better explanation for the accumulated bulk of results of many scattering experiments and also as an attempt to uh, get the demise of Thompson's uh, research group. There is a large variety of experiments provided data that serve as evidence in this new sense that I have worked with you here in my presentation to different atomic models and the relationship between such evidences and models is quite complex and inter iterative and interactive. Thompson and Rutherford's models are just adjusting the reality in certain degrees and aspects and we can introduce a semantic uh, component here. Mathematical analysis do, does not show the presence of a nucleus because the relationship cannot be deductive uh, and then it should be seen rather as abductive because the new idea is provided or proposed to account for the facts and then is accepted thanks to its epistemic value and to contextual factors that are very complex and, and form part of the of the object of study of the history of science. So, and just to finish, if we use the paper as a primary source as in Breno's presentation, we go back to this uh, paragraph. 
It is interesting to notice that there's a mixture of rhetorics in the original 1911 paper. Sometimes Rutherford is being quite demonstrative, uh, saying this is the exactly the relation to be expecting on the theory of single scattering, blah, blah, blah. Of course, this cannot be fully demonstrative because we don't know the value of truth of the point of departure. So it's not a syllogism uh, in stricto sensu. But it masquerades as a syllogism, as a Aristotelian syllogism, because it says, okay, if we know this, then we know that. And this is an exact relationship of necessity, of uh, deductive necessity. Some other parts uh, are closer to Peirce's, Peirce's ideas, uh, like the idea of reproduction, which is one of the four main reconstructions of deductive reasoning in Peirce, and says, okay, uh, it, As the, uh, these uh, particles traverse the atom, it should be possible from a close study of the nature of the deflection to form an idea of the constitution of matter or, or the nucleus. Okay. So, so uh, as a conclusion, the quite stereotyped historical episode, but still mistreated in science teaching that I have presented to you, when it is reconstructed with a third mode, a temperate mode of inquiry that is not as uh, cut out and as simplistic as the narrative and the uh, logical linguistic. Uh, it's much more respectful of the findings of historians uh, of science and philosophers of science and the dedication of science, and at the same time can teach students important content of the nature of science. Okay. Thank you very much. In my last slide, there is a, hel a cry for help uh, un universities in Argentina are in a very bad moment now, so I'm, I'm fighting for public universities, and so is the case in Brazil. For a Temer, for a Macri. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I think the time was okay. Okay, Peter. Little Newton. PA. This is this is not about Newton. Um, The, the contrast between the, I don't know if we should call them streamlined, simplified, downscaled versions, and the richer evidence-based thing is, is very nicely portrayed. And I'm wondering how much uh, time or length is a factor simply in which version will appear. In other words, if you have time and you expand the time and go into more detail, these other alternative explanations, uh, other experiments that provide evidence, um, the uncertainties that, that go into the reflection become part of the story. And the, But the moment that you try to turn this into a, a little sidebar or um, what I call a vignette, that may not be fair, um, automatically forces you to abandon this, these more uh, textured, more uh, faithful and authentic portrayals of the ways of thinking. I, I, do you think about this at all? Yeah, I have thought very much about this issue. I, I can quote Stephen Brush's classical paper, Should the History of Science Be X-Rated? Because if it, you really believe, you as collective science teachers really believe that it's a matter of time and we don't have the time, then just keep the vignette. Then no indication of pseudo-history, authoritarian pseudo-history. So it, it will be an opposition between authoritarian pseudo-history and a much richer account of the thing. So it will be just an opposition of should I use history, philosophy and of science or should I not use? If I don't have the time, I don't use, and I just present the facts. Okay, we know now that there is a nucleus, cha 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 cha, and this can be traced back to Rutherford and his intrigues and machinations. As opposed to when you think that this episode from the history of science is educationally valuable, and you are going to use some more time to go into it. And one more uh, thing: if you take the second uh, option, it's in the understanding that it's not that important rather for the nucleus. What is important is rather for the nucleus as an epitome or as a paradigm, a paradigmatic example of scientific reasoning and discovery and the mechanics of the new physics of the first quarter of the 20th century. And then 
you revise your ID on time and say, okay, it's worth that I give two lessons of four hours each devoted to Rutherford and his intrigues and machinations because they are an epitome of how physics changed severely in 50 years, last quarter of 19th century, first quarter. So I, I, I sympathize with your, with your comment, but I think we should teach our teachers or make them feel uh, as we feel that it's not a position between cheap history and sophisticated history. It's an opposition between should I open the box and see it historically and philosophically or just to the plain content. Option B is okay, depends on the aims of the formation. I think it's okay for university training of biologists and it's not okay for the university training of biology teachers. And I'm being dogmatic and apodictic and authoritarian. Uh, thank you. That, that, very good. I, um, two small questions for you. Um, wh why not just drop hacking completely? I, I, I'm not sure why you need to go into a discussion about different modes of inquiry. Why not just, you, you, you're suggesting a third mode. Why not just have one mode and, and call it IBE or, or abductive reasoning or defeasible reasoning or, or whatever. Uh, it, 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 uh, it all comes together. Um, and then you don't have to sort of uh, excuse this, this third mode being closer to deduction rather than uh, uh, the amplitude reasoning. And in fact, I think it's the other way around, by the way. But I, I think you could bypass that and just, just start with IBE and I'm wondering if that resonates with you. I think in a few years, two years from now, you will see that I do that. But the two main motivations for doing this long path into the center of my presentation, one is that it, it's a genealogy of my ideas, how I came to, to them, because I'm still interested in the, in the, in the Crombian hacking framework and in the... Uh, Brunerian approach that is dichotomic. And the second uh, thing is that I wanted to rescue, and I didn't know that Peter was going to do it from another perspective, the new experimentalism, to rescue these uh, styles of thinking and the Crombie hacking framework that are uh, thrown into oblivion because of the overemphasizing of the classical modes, orthodox modes. So I wanted to show the intellectual uh, affinity or continuity between uh, the new uh, philosophies of science of the last quarter of the 20th century that moved to this, uh, the forgotten ways of thinking and arguing, and my own ideas. The, the, that's why at the very beginning I talked about, about the convergence between uh, working narratives and working inference and argumentation, which are two of my lines of research as a group. So, so if I may follow up, and, and, and thank you, that I think I'm looking forward to two years from now where we just begin, uh, yeah, just, um, it, how accepted was the Thompson plum pudding model uh, when Rutherford began this work? And, and, and the reason I'm asking is, I, I'm wondering if you could comment on how accepted in uh, uh, the climate of opinion, uh, of informed opinion was, and given that level of acceptance, the type of abductive reasoning that would have been needed would have obviously changed. So I'm wondering if you... It's a very nice question, a very difficult one. I think I will answer it first generally and then in the details. The general answer is that no, and Roberto can correct me or can expand, no physical model between 1875 and 1925 was accepted as fully as we think now because the changes were so fast. So if you see, if you think retrodictively and think that uh, it's the same case for the plum pudding, that rather for uh, open model, then it should have taken seven years to stabilize and to be loved by the community. But the paper is 1906, so in seven years it's 1913. So the, the times are so packed up that there was no such stabilization. And I think uh, Roberto can explain more with more beautiful examples. So I think that um, we could approach the thing uh, with, uh, with the idea of uh, physicist common sense, which was 
back there as the uh, line of knowledge, the base of knowledge uh, that was extended in the in the 1910s and 20s, 1910s, 1910s and 1920s. Uh, one interesting thing is that many of these things that we say that were invented, discovered these big guys and they were this way and that way and we picture in the books and we portray in the books were just um, knowledge that was circulating in an oral form, not even published because the rhythm of publication was so fast that we say, okay, he proposed a plum pudding and he said, that's not the case. He said plum pudding once in a conference and there's a reconstruction of such uh, saying and it's very blurred and very confusing. So uh, I would say that uh, the degree of acceptance is a degree of acceptance of an explanation that satisfies everyone just as in the episode of ALF. And that's the reason that I put ALF there and I want to work with teachers with such episodes. With this strong parallelism, okay, this is just to be uh, reassured. We all know that ALF broke the window, okay, no proof needed end of the story. So we all know that the plum pudding is okay, more or less, end of the story, until we see that uh, homogeneous distribution of charges, both positive and negative, is at odds with some of the results when, when the results are refined enough. When they're coarse-grained, it's okay. When they're refined, we have that divergence. In fact, we falsify the episode. We say he found a nucleus which is, was very small, but was uh, extended. It, that's not what Rutherford says. Rutherford talks about a divergence of the charge. So no space, it's just one point, geometrical point, where all the charge was concentrated. Then, of course, th that's physically impossible. He talks, should be a space, very small, compared to the whole sphere, blah, blah, blah. But the mathematics is that of a divergence of the charge, which is the only thing that can explain the, the bouncing and the deflections. Okay. Thank you very much for the question. Quite difficult, I must say. Um, but thank you, Professor. I would like to ask if you could give us uh, any details on the dynamics of bringing such a perspective to the classroom. Yep. What would be the, the professor's job and what would be the student's job in, on their attempt to access history and philosophy of science through this perspective? Okay, that's a long question. I will answer it in the coffee, but uh, I, I think it's long because it depends on whether the students are primary and secondary students or are prospective science teachers or in-service science teachers. In the second case that I developed here, and I will answer now, and then the first case for the coffee, uh, we are on the assumption that they know the physics. So we are not discovering the nucleus. We know that Rutherford discovered the nucleus for us, and we are trying to inspect the uh, laborious paths of reasoning and argumentation. So what we would say, what we would do is more or less what you saw in a velocity that was incompatible with human thinking. Meaning that we go first out of physics, philosophy, and history. Very far away from philosophy, history, didactics, and physics. Just as you saw in ALF and other devices that I've uh, concocted and published. If you see my publications, you see how I get into some other context that has nothing to do with physics and only indirectly with history, philosophy, and didactics of science. When we uh, try out these ideas in such a context and you are comfortable enough, then you move back to physics. So this would be the answer. The, my didactical units uh, more or less are uh, four hours long two sections of two hours, so just four hours in continuity, I'm talking about prospective and service science teachers, okay, at the university. So the four hours are devoted to first trying out and inspecting very sophisticated philosophical ideas, then uh, uh, moving back to the historical context, and then applying it to a more uh, general and transversal nature of science with contemporary science or some uh, orthodox context that, you know, with uh, primary and secondary students, we, I do something else and I can explain later on, okay? Thank you.